Welcome back to Our Sustainable Future. Plastic has only been with us for about 70 years, and yet has truly transformed the way we live. Plastic is so cheap to make, and it can be engineered in so many different ways, that it has become the material of choice for all sorts of products. And yet, we know there's something dark lurking behind all this plastic. Many of us have heard a lot lately about plastic ocean pollution. We've seen tragic images of turtles with straws stuck up their noses, seals caught in ghost nets, and seabirds with plastic in their stomachs. On a positive note, there is a growing awareness that all is not right with so much plastic in our lives, and people are starting to advocate for change with initiatives underway right now, such as banning straws, limiting single-use plastics, and using more environmentally friendly alternatives to all that plastic packaging for the stuff that we buy. Yet even with these initiatives, the problem of plastic pollution is only increasing around the world. Part of that is because we're seeing more and more plastic in everything that impacts our daily life. In fact, global production trends indicate that the amount of plastic produced every year will double in the next few decades. And where will all this plastic end up at its end of life? Landfills, if we're lucky, but we know a lot of it ends up in the environment, and that's a serious cause for concern. For me, I believe this is one of the major crises facing us right now, right up there with climate change. Why? Let's take a look at what's going on here and find out. If you think about it, few materials have had such an impact on our lives as plastic. Even though it's only been around since about the 1950s, it has truly revolutionized the way we live. It's incredibly inexpensive to make, and engineers can tailor its properties to suit all sorts of applications. Think of all the medical equipment we now make with plastic as a way of keeping things hygienic and safe for us and hospital workers. Cars these days are using fiber-reinforced plastic body panels that provide structural integrity and added safety for the occupants, yet are much lighter than steel panels, allowing for much greater fuel efficiency. And much of the airframe of the Boeing Dreamliner is also made from fiber-reinforced plastic composites, allowing for much greater range and lower emissions than can otherwise be obtained from the use of more conventional materials. And who would have imagined that we need to have our cucumbers wrapped in plastic film? While this may sound a little bit silly, our cucumbers often come from thousands of miles away, and the only way to keep them from dehydrating along their journey to your grocery store is to wrap them in protective packaging. So plastics are inexpensive, able to be used in all sorts of medical applications, help cars and airplanes become more fuel efficient, and can significantly reduce food waste. And think about how plastic has transformed the clothes we wear. I'm a big bicycle rider, and like the folks in that top image, our cycling gear is almost all performance wear made from polymer fibers that wick away all the sweat that you might generate while climbing a big hill. And do you like to ski? I'll bet most of your ski wear has a significant amount of polyester fiber that very effectively blocks the wind, yet keeps you warm even in the chilliest of ski conditions. And if you're into yoga and need to do a well-executed downward dog, you need clothes that move with you. Yoga gear, and in fact most of today's athleisure wear, is made from stretchy polymer fibers that enable you to move into all sorts of ways. And when your clothes need to get laundered, you just toss them into the washing machine. What could be simpler? But there's a downside to all this plastic use. There's so much of it right now that the world can't really keep up with where to put it all when we're done using it. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of types of plastics. Different chemistries such as polyester and nylon, different colors, different additives to give each type its own unique engineering properties, and of course different shapes, from plastic bottles to plastic film to plastic fibers for textiles. And what happens when we're done using it? In many places around the world, it's too expensive to recycle, even with an effective recycling collection system. You can't compost plastics, so that's not an option. 
For the most part, plastics end up in our trash bins and then end up in a landfill, if we're lucky. In many parts of the world, the buildup of plastic trash is faster than the garbage collection systems can handle it. As a result, plastic often winds up in the environment, and particularly the oceans. The image here is becoming all too common across the globe. Plastic pollution washing up on beaches in coastal regions everywhere. Fortunately, many of us are becoming more and more aware of this challenge. We're bringing our reusable grocery bags to the store rather than use those one-time only film bags. And of course, plastic straws are a thing of the past for some of us. We're also starting to learn a lot more about plastic ocean pollution and its impact on marine life. Ghost nets are a big problem. These are nets from commercial fishing operations that have been lost, abandoned, or just tossed overboard when out to sea. In the old days, these were made of natural fibers, such as cotton, hemp, or jute, and would eventually biodegrade in the ocean. But today, they're made mostly of nylon, a super strong and durable plastic fiber. Nylon is very resistant to degradation in a marine environment, which means these ghost nets could be in the ocean for hundreds of years, if not longer, entangling the unknowing marine life that happened to be swimming by. Back around 2010, photographs such as this one started to circulate around the world and was a real wake-up call about the dangers of plastic pollution. The image is of an albatross that lived on Midway Island in the South Pacific. It perished, and what is clearly visible are lots of small plastic bits that were in its stomach when it died. Scientists now check for plastic ingested by birds, land animals, and marine life, and routinely find plastic in their stomachs. This is not good news for these animals, as their digestive systems don't break down this plastic. Unfortunately, it then interferes with their normal eating patterns, and if there is enough plastic in their stomachs, then there isn't enough room for real food, and they ultimately starve to death, like this poor albatross here. We're also finding ever smaller pieces of plastic seemingly everywhere. These small plastic fragments are called microplastics, and are technically defined as plastic pieces less than five millimeters in size, or about one-fifth of an inch. But microplastics have been found that are a whole lot smaller than that even. In fact, researchers are finding microplastics smaller than the diameter of a human hair. And these are particularly troublesome, because we don't know how to get rid of these all that easily. What's worse, the smaller these fragments become, the more they start to look like food to other animals. And so researchers are starting to find not only large pieces of plastic in the stomachs of animals like we saw on the last slide, but tiny pieces of microplastic in small animals, often at the lower ends of the food chain. And an important question today is, what are the health impacts of ingesting all this microplastic? We really don't know for sure but it certainly isn't something most of us would want to look forward to on our dinner plates. We know that once large chunks of plastic make their way to the ocean, over time they break down into microplastics. So how does that happen? It starts with the sun. The ultraviolet rays from the sun interact with the chemical structure of the plastic, making it highly brittle. You may already have seen this if you look at a piece of plastic that has been in the sun for a long time it's easy to break up into smaller pieces. Once the plastic becomes brittle, agitation from the waves and bumping into other pieces of plastic break it up even more into smaller and smaller bits. And the process continues with smaller pieces continuing to fragment into such a small size until they are classified as microplastics. As we've said earlier, the problem with all these plastics and microplastics is that they look like food to many animals. Birds see the colorful plastic bits floating on the surface and swoop down to eat a few, and potentially end up looking like the poor albatross that we've seen earlier. Fish see the microplastic fragments and decide they look tasty to eat too, and now we see fish with stomachs full of plastic. Over time, algae grow on the surface of the microplastic pieces causing them to sink to the ocean floor. And once there, they look pretty tasty to organisms such as shrimp, 
crabs, and other bottom-feeding species. And now we see shrimp with their digestive tracts full of microplastics. Of course, in the marine world, crabs and shrimp are food for other species up the food chain. Fish become food for other fish, and then for us. And if each of these species is starting to show the presence of plastics in them, how much longer will it take until we start to see the presence of plastic in us? But this isn't just an ocean problem. We're starting to find microplastics show up in many of the waterways even far from the oceans, such as the lakes and rivers close to our own backyards. What's going on here? Analysis of these microplastics is showing the presence of small microfibers, such as you see here in the right-hand image. These fibers are really tiny, sometimes one-fifth of the diameter of a human hair, or about 10 to 20 microns in diameter. And when researchers do a chemical analysis of these fibers, a lot of them look like polyester. Well, where would polyester fibers come from? Well, from us, actually. Remember all those performance clothes that we like to wear? They're often made from polyester fibers, or more technically known as polyethylene terephthalate, that same material that's used to make those plastic film grocery bags we now hate, and that infamous water bottle that we try to avoid. Every time we wash those clothes, some of the polyester fibers shed, meaning they come apart from the clothing and these fibers end up in the wastewater from the washing machine or in the air once in the dryer. In the case of the washing machine wastewater, the fibers just travel on through and enter the same wastewater stream from the rest of the house. And once it gets to the local wastewater treatment plant, the fibers are so small they can't get filtered out, so they just ultimately flow on out into the local waterway and now we have plastic microfibers in our rivers, streams, and lakes. The good news is that we're starting to be a lot more aware of all the downside of this plastic use. And as we'll see in future lessons, innovative entrepreneurs are creating bioplastics that degrade in your compost bin. Packaging companies are looking at more natural materials for your takeout dinner. But even with these positive changes, the use of plastic is growing faster than ever before. This is a plot of plastic production from about 1950 through 2015 when these data were reported. The graph shows that we are now producing more than 400 million metric tons of plastic every year, and that's a lot of plastic. What is also very interesting is that half of all the plastic ever produced has come in the last 20 years or so. The graph also shows where all this plastic went in terms of applications during that time frame. It's easy to see that almost half of today's plastic production goes into packaging, like the clamshell full of strawberries that we buy at the grocery store, or the plastic wrap on those cucumbers that we talked about earlier. You can see all the other applications for plastic, such as transportation, consumer products, and textiles, and in each case, the use of plastic is increasing every year. Perhaps the biggest takeaway from this graph is this. Even though we're beginning to understand the dangers of plastic entering the environment, we're also producing more and more of it every year, with projections suggesting that we'll make twice as much plastic in 2050 as we are today. And where do we think all that plastic will end up when we're done with it? Estimates indicate that 11% of all plastic waste nearly 20 million metric tons, has already ended up in aquatic ecosystems. That's a lot of water bottles, candy wrappers, and grocery bags. We need to do better. Let's wrap up our discussion with a few key takeaways. On the positive side of things, plastic is a pretty amazing material. It's super cheap to make, and it can be engineered to have a variety of properties that are valuable to us. Life wouldn't be the same without it. Yet the unintended consequences of a super cheap and durable material is that it is easier to just toss when you're done with it. In some cases, using it just once, like our water bottles, creating a huge trash problem. With the amount of plastic produced each year increasing, and more of it being single-use plastic, we're creating a lot of trash. So much, in fact, that garbage collection systems have a hard time handling it all 
and so a lot of plastic escapes the landfill and ends up in the environment. And once in the environment, it not only creates an ugly pollution problem, but a real crisis for other species. Plastic fragments and even more damaging microplastic fragments are ending up in the stomachs of all sorts of wildlife, from birds to fish to shrimp and likely us. And while we're not sure about the health impacts of ingesting all this plastic, it definitely can't be a good thing having all of this plastic in our systems. The most important takeaway is this. There is no doubt that this is a problem that we've created, and so this is a problem that we need to solve. A business-as-usual approach will be catastrophic for us, the wildlife around us, and for the ecosystems we all depend upon. It's not only imperative that we address this from a sustainability perspective, but also from a moral one. For our next lesson, we're going to ask the question, how much can we actually extract from the earth to make all the stuff we need? And how much can we dump back onto the earth when we're done with all the stuff that we presumably need? We'll introduce a relatively new concept known as the Anthropocene, meaning a new era where we humans are starting to influence the once natural flows of the planet. There's a lot more to come. I'm Michael Reedy, and I'll see you next time.